Yes, 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 yes. It is in the room. Everything we have need of, it's in the room. I dare you right now just to say that to yourself, all that I have need of, the Spirit of the Lord has provided it, and it is in the room. All pain, all fear, all hopelessness, all despair, all anger and malice, it is gone. I eschew those things, and I bring that which I need from you into the room. God, we stand in the gap on behalf of so many across the country who are indeed um, just living uh, in the aftermath of this great uh, tumult that has once again swept across uh, the face of this nation. Um, we, God, acknowledge that even in the midst of this wickedness, you are still God. And beside you, there is no other. We pray and intercede on behalf of our nation, on behalf of our political and elected leaders, on behalf of those who have the power to make justice and peace reign in the land. The scripture reminds us, oh God, that when the wicked rule, the people groan, but when the righteous rule, everyone is happy. Everyone experiences peace and joy. And so God, we ask right now that the wickedness that has been unleashed in this land, Lord God, that has reached a tipping point, God, we bring that under subjection in the name of Jesus. We ask God that you will keep reminding us that your power and your strength, oh God, is greater than that of the enemy, that the schemes and the wicked machinations, Lord God, of those who are greedy and filled with malice and filled with with uh, 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 war and, and, and conflict, God, we do not believe that these forces will win. Even in the midst, oh God, of, of what it appears to be uh, evil running amok, God, we know that you are not mocked. And God, you are still, Lord God, working things out through us. We who are the faithful, we are the called according to your purpose. So God, even as this wickedness has raged. Lord, we know that there is still the presence of coronavirus in our communities. Lord, there are still our frontline workers who are every day waking up, Lord, to provide uh, minimal care to our communities, to those who are afflicted, those who are continuing to work every day in essential work. God, we lift them up to you. Those, Lord God, who have fallen ill, Lord God, those who have uh, suffered from the corona. God, we lift them up to you. Lord, we lift up our loved ones who are incarcerated in San Quentin and Folsom and Santa Rita, Lord God. Uh, we lift them up to you, Lord God. Those who are, are in prisons and facilities, Lord God, and COVID is raging and they're receiving minimal care. I pray, God, that you will touch the hearts and the minds of even those who have the authority, Lord God, to provide mercy and that Lord God, mask and, and mitigation efforts will make it even into the jails and the prisons. God, we lift up our loved ones who are uh, still incarcerated at the border, Lord God. We continue, Lord God, to mourn all the many ways that wickedness is, Lord God, among us, Lord. And, and it appears at times things are moving too slow, but we have faith, we have trust, and we act, Lord God, in ways that remind us that victory is within our reach. We lift up, Lord, the, the rise in shootings and gun-related homicides. Lord, we lift up this scourge, Lord God, of death that is too indicative in our land. I pray, God, for peace in the middle of all of these storms. And we as a people, God, we come to you on this Sunday, Lord God, the second Sunday in January. We come to you, God, mindful that even in this new year, as we are consecrating, as we are fasting, as we are praying, as we are, are God, seeking your faith, show us, show yourself strong. God, be made manifest to us in a real and concrete way. Take a few moments, everybody, right where you are, and let's just lift up our hands to God, and let's just invite God, even right now. Lord, I invite you in this moment and in this season, Lord God, to keep showing yourself, keep revealing yourself, keep reminding us, Lord God, that you are at work among us. And we will say thank you, Lord. Now bless our time of worship today. Bless our time, Lord God, of gathering. Bless our time of preaching and teaching. Bless our time of, Lord, discipleship and fellowship. Lord, I pray that you will 
break up the fallow ground in our hearts, that you will uh, discomfort us in those places we are too comfortable, and you will, will, Lord God, provide relief, Lord God, in those places where we, are God, are, are uh, uh, experiencing pain and, 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 and dissonance. I pray, God, that you will show yourself strong today through the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Come on, everybody. Just thank the Lord. Thank the Lord real quick. We thank you, God. We bless you, Lord. We give your name the glory uh, for the great opportunity we have to be together. Um, I'm so glad to be able to sit before you one more time. Obviously, this week has just been so filled with uh, uh, challenge and struggle. Uh, I, I, I was speaking to another group of our leaders this week and, and, and literally said, we have seen the highest of highs and we've seen the lowest of lows. Uh, many of you are certainly uh, aware of the, the election that took place in Georgia that so many of us helped to uh, uh, secure some, some uh, voting victories, we believe, on behalf of our communities. And, and uh, my good friend, uh, Reverend Dr. Pastor Raphael Warnock, was able to, to uh, win his uh, uh, race and, and uh, make it into the Senate, the first black senator from the state of Georgia. Um, he is a, a student of James Cone. Um, and has uh, uh, figured out a way to wiggle his way into the Senate. Somebody say amen. So now we got a black theologian, Lord have mercy, in the Senate. Now you know there's about to be some liberation uh, just swimming around them halls up in there, right? And John Ossoff, the, the um, uh, son of a Jewish immigrant, um, I mean just the, the power of that symbolism uh, 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 making its way into the Senate to literally wrestle control, uh, at least stewardship, in a way of the political uh, highest political systems, what in a direction that we believe is more uh, conducive to peace and justice. And certainly, we still have work to do to push our elected officials on every level to be accountable. But that is a victory for all of us who love peace and justice. Uh, the self-proclaimed Grim Reaper of the Senate, Mitch McConnell, is no longer. Uh, uh, in charge of the Senate. So that means that we can now literally have legislation being brought up to votes. We can now vote for gun violence uh, reform. We can vote for health care reform. We can vote for a Justice and Policing Act. We can vote for uh, uh, judicial appointments. We can do all kinds of things that we were not able to do because of the diabolical nature of uh, some of our political leadership. And then literally less than 24 hours from then, we saw uh, uh, attempted coup, an in attempted insurrection um, attack on the U.S. Capitol uh, by some of our most misguided, I, I think, uh, 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 possessed um, uh, American uh, citizens uh, who uh, are so filled with grievance and rage and under the hypnosis of uh, this maniacal, uh, uh, soon-to-be ex-president, Donald Trump. And so... Um, just watching both the highest of highs and the lowest of lows, I'm sure for all of us it has left us uh, quite dizzy and quite dazed, and, and certainly uh, we're not uh, exempt from the regular challenges that many of us have to face, economic insecurity, COVID, uh, the issues of violence in our communities, all of it. It's just a continuous flow of challenges, but I do believe uh, that uh, the passages of scripture that we read last week are so apropos for this season and this time. And, and so I'm going to continue in the vein of, of our preaching from last week. We're going to just talk a little bit about uh, rise and shine and, and continuing to go down into the book of Isaiah, chapter number 60, um, because I do believe there is something significant that God wants from us. There's something that God wants you and I uh, to be prepared to engage in. This is a season this whole year of rebuilding, recovery, reimagining, reclaiming. Uh, in so many ways, we are now seeing that it's not just about the imminent threat that is COVID, but there is also a persistent and imminent and, and outlasting uh, uh, wickedness that we must defeat and continue to overcome, and that is the white supremacists, Christian nationalists, uh, hierarchies that uh, continue to plague our society. 
So as we get ready to jump into the biblical text, I invite you to turn with me to the book of Isaiah, chapter number 60. We are going to reread these passages. And last week we talked in great detail about the importance of we as God's people moving into this new season, this new year, right? Not um, in a way that leaves us ahistorical to the, 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 the kinds of, of challenges we've had previously, but knowing that there is indeed an opportunity for us to uh, build on that which has come before us. Uh, often, when we attempt to make uh, new starts, we, we are so quick to uncouple uh, the struggle of our past um, and say, I'm just going to wipe the table clean and start anew. But what if God is actually trying to help you build on that which has happened in your immediate past as a foundation? for that which would be better, that which needs to be reclaimed. I, I want you to know that there is an opportunity for us as master builders. Um, it is a powerful, powerful opportunity for us to not uh, render ourselves as always starting from scratch, but saying, how can God, I take everything that has happened in my life, in my experiences, redeem them. Somebody ought to say, there's redemption for me. There's redemption for you. Redeem those things and allow those things to be a foundation that helps propel me and us into our future. The book of Isaiah then um, is an important, I think, way to describe the possibility of this process of levels of, of, of ascension, of, of, of building, um, of, of, of taking that which has been handed to us often through our own decisions or things that are out of our control and still allowing the power of God to remind us that no matter what circumstance I or we are in, Lord, the scripture tells us we must rise and shine. Oh, come on, just tell you that to, to, to one of your neighbors in the in the chat, I, I need to, you to rise and shine this morning. I need you to rise and shine. Isaiah, Isaiah chapter number 60, verse number one. This is what the scripture reminds us, a group of anonymous prophets reminding us, individuals who have been moved on by the spirit of God in the midst of their circumstances, reminding us that God can speak through anyone. God can use anything. God can uh, 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 redeem any circumstance and still give us or marching orders for how to live in spite and in light of our circumstance. The scripture says like this, Arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you, for darkness shall cover the earth, thick darkness the peoples, but the Lord will rise upon you, and God's glory will appear over you. Nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Verse number four says, so lift up your eyes and look around. They all gather together. They come to you. Your sons shall come from far away and your daughters shall be carried on their nurses' arms. Verse five, then you shall see and be radiant. Lord, my God. Your heart shall thrill and rejoice. Why? Because the abundance of the sea shall be brought to you. The wealth of the nations shall come to you. The word of God for us, the people of God. Again, let us say thanks be to God. We are, again, calling on us to rise and shine. Now, uh, this week I, I, I have been brought back to this passage uh, as a description, uh, 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 a warning, if you will. Uh, the proverb says that uh, you cannot hold fire in your bosom and not be burned. And what we have seen this week is, in many respects, the culmination, the capstone of four years of politicized fire that has been uh, held too close to the heart of the highest echelons of power in this country, the presidency of Donald Trump, the appeasement and complicity of Republicans and even some Democrats, um, the inability of leaders at almost every level in the church, in the business sector, in our law enforcement spaces, in our uh, organizing and justice spaces, far too many of us have not been able to discern the fire 
that literally has been closely held in a more unique and concentrated way at the heart of American political power. And what we saw this week was the overrunning of that fire. We saw uh, armed insurrectionists, which uh, is a great big word uh, for people who would try to overthrow the government with force. We saw them storming the Capitol. We saw individuals who in a, their regular everyday lives, if you will, would hold positions of great respectability, great uh, notoriety. They are people who would be considered successful. You saw elected officials. You saw law enforcement leaders. You saw lawyers and doctors. You saw small business owners. You saw all of these individuals uh, hypnotized under the, the deception and wickedness of an individual that has been able to appeal to the most sinister impulses of many Americans. And it is important for you and I to appreciate that what this moment has represented for us is the danger of holding fire in our bosom too closely and not expecting the consequences to be far greater than that which any of us could have imagined. I mean, there is certainly a lesson uh, that we can take on both a macro and a micro level, because for many of us, although we may not be caught in the hypnosis of this political leader, there is a hypnosis, I believe, all of us are susceptible to. There is a way of life, a way of thinking, a way of acting that appeals to parts of us that if the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the glory of the Lord is not fully unleashed regularly with deep interrogation and humility, with community, those able to help us reimagine and reclaim and recover, those who are able to help us build. If these uh, uh, practices are not at work among us regularly, we will find ourselves caught with fire in our bosom. And I want you to know, loved one, that uh, this whole season of consecration is a great moment for you and I to check the fire that we may be holding too closely in our bosom, to ask ourselves in our relationships, in our uh, politics, in our uh, posture towards our health, our, our, our economic uh, um, existence and practices, what are the things that are causing the fracture and fragmentation in my life, in my family, and even in the life of our communities? Because none of this happens in a vacuum. As a matter of fact, what we know to be true is those sins, those vices, those growing edges that are left unattended to will fester and grow. And those blind spots, those things that start as blind spots can easily grow into blindness. And if you are a person who lacks vision and lacks sight, you will find yourself more susceptible to the compelling machinations of those who are able to create a a, a, a description of reality that causes us to lose heart, lose faith, and to fall in despair. And I've often said it, hopelessness is as deadly as a bullet. And because hopelessness is as deadly as a bullet, your job, my job, even as we go through these challenges, is to never lose the hope of God, the power that allows us to find God's activity even among us. This is what we see in the biblical text today. The prophets are, are even in the midst of their, their desperation, they are seeing and looking and, 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 and experiencing the rising of God's glory. And it is this rise that I want us to spend some time talking about today because as we talked about in the, the, the previous sermon, Sometimes the kinds of challenges that are coming our way are opportunities for us to master, to master certain uh, experiences and tools that give us what we need for this next level. And child of God, I want you to know this. There is a need for the mastery of certain skills, certain disciplines, certain 
uh, practices that will help navigate us through these perilous times. The prophet is speaking to the people of Israel who have just come out of bondage and they are attempting to find their way. They're attempting to re build their community, to uh, reclaim their identity as God's people. They are trying to figure out and navigate through the wickedness of bondage, but also the, the, the challenges of freedom. Because how many of you know uh, bondage is quite a, 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 a very tough burden to carry, but sometimes we who are not able to, to have the discipline for freedom can actually cause our, allow our freedoms to create the conditions that drive us back in to spaces of bondage. I want you to know that there is an opportunity for you and I to ask ourselves, God, where are you inviting me to be not just free from, but free for? God, I want to be free from these vices, but I want to be free for your service. I want to be free from these struggles and challenges and habits, but I want to be free for uh, the, 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 the kinds of purposes and plans that you have for my life. You ought to just put that in the chat. God, help me to be not just free from, but help me to be free for in this season. Help me to be free for your glory and your light to shine. Uh, we see in the passage a, a very powerful description about how the light has come, but it speaks in great detail about the darkness. And, and I think it's so important for us to keep reminding ourselves that when the biblical text talks about darkness, the biblical text is not feeding into the kind of, of anti-black uh, uh, sentiments that are so pervasive in our culture, which we saw on display uh, in just such a most purest, uh, 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 clearest form. When the siege of the Capitol happened, we found that the kind of, of, of complicity and the kind of care that was extended to these individuals, their gripes and their, 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 their uh, anger was deemed um, not just uh, acceptable, but folks could relate to it. Those who had certain levels of power inside the Capitol could relate to this, and they were not able to realize that there is a dangerous confluence between Trumpism, between white supremacy, and between the kinds of anti-black racism, the kinds of underpinnings of evangelical theological uh, 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 domination that has too often informed our politics and our social interactions. We were uh, uh, speaking and reflecting on the work of Dr. John Powell most, most frequently, and, and we, we, we had a wonderful and important conversation about one of the greatest challenges in our contemporary world is dis disassociating darkness as a pejorative and subhuman description of darker-skinned people and their flesh. This is an important linguistic uh, conversation because even now we are hearing the, the, the issues that have happened in our um, uh, uh, capital uh, are, are being described as some of the most dark days in our society, right, in our capitals or in our country's history. I want you to know, child of God, that our language at times, when it's over-associating darkness with the a skin tone of our community members and of our families and our friends, we don't even know that our subconscious is actually continuing to create certain kinds of dehumanizing markers in our lives and in our communities and in our associations. It is indeed the case that John Powell describes this as the racialization of our consciousness, and it bears itself out in the ways we think about assigning value and worth. A recent poll was taken in our country that talked about how 51% of Americans expressed anti-black attitudes compared with 48% in a similar survey some years ago. When measured by an implicit racial attitudes test, the number of Americans with anti-black sentiments jumped to 56%, jumped from 56%, or jumped to 56% from 49% during the last cycle of elections. Most Americans expressed anti-Hispanic sentiments. An AP survey done showed that there was 52% of non-Hispanic 
whites who expressed anti-Hispanic attitudes. And that figure in implicit bias tests rose to 57%. The ramifications of this can be seen in so many stark ways when one looks at the prison systems, one looks at the ways in which our communities are, are handled by uh, law enforcement officers. Isn't it fascinating that we saw on display this week that, that, that uh, white, white uh, terrorists, if you will, <laughs> or white insurrectionists, better word, white insurrectionists uh, who would unleash violence were handled with such care, but black uh, protesters or folks who are pushing for justice and inclusion are handled with great terror by some of these very same law enforcement systems. We see the marginalization of immigrant populations and the othering of Muslims and other groups who are considered dark in skin tone or morality. And the greatest scourge and the reality of this truth is seen in the loss of life via gun violence and, and how these issues are often uh, attributed as collective punishment to communities. I want to boldly proclaim that when the scripture talks about darkness covering the earth and darkness covering the peoples, that we are not talking about a pejorative description of, 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 of black bodies, of dark skinned bodies, of, of indigenous bodies, but we are talking about blindness. Uh, I love how uh, uh, Dr. Will Gaffney uh, gives us other language to plug in these words in scripture, um, at least in the translations, that rather than use darkness, whenever you see the word darkness, uh, do a mind switch and insert the word gloom. Insert uh, the, these words that actually describe not the pejorative nature of these descriptions, but a description of that which is devoid of light, hope, and healing. Now, when the scripture says that darkness is covering the earth, it is talking about the presence of blindness that is indicative of the lack of light. And so many of us find ourselves existing in a season and a reality of doom. Why? Because we have eschewed the light. And when you eschew light, you find yourself bumbling around in spaces that cause you harm. But if the light were on, you could navigate and you could avoid some of these pitfalls. And this is the greatest indictment, I believe, on the American church, particularly uh, the white church. And we who find our authority um, uh, too tied to white mainstream Christian faith. There is a lot of gloom and blindness in the practice of the American church that we are not able to ascertain and discern authoritarianism, violence, fascism, that we make theological excuses for the subjugation of people groups based on race, gender, sexual orientation, class, uh, a nation of origin, that we find ways to make sense of violence being spread across the globe. I mean, would you imagine the kind of indictment that one could level on we who name the name of Jesus in the American context, that when the scripture is saying that darkness is spread among all of the earth and it covers all of the earth, that that could actually be an indictment on our government and our citizenry who continue to profligate and promote the kind of practices that literally continue to imperialize the world. That sometimes, when we engage in this kind of complicity, when we appease this kind of wickedness, it gets so out of our control, it metastasizes and it grows to a place where you cannot even keep a hold of that fire that you had in your bosom. And that's what we see and that's what we saw. We find individuals who were so amped up and so led uh, by the gloominess of their, of their existence, the, the, the darkness of their reality, that they laid siege to the Capitol and literally had cameras recording their own demise. There's such powerful, powerful metaphors in this because often we do not know that sometimes when we are not fully cognizant of the ways in which we are living uh, out a, a gloomy, blind existence, 
but others who are in the light, Lord have mercy, can look in on our circumstance and they can offer a critique to us that should allow us to correct our path. I want you to know that correction is an example of the light of the glory of God that is rising among us. Godly correction, hopeful correction, love-centered correction, correction that is grounded in the truths of God's word and in the disciplines and the wisdoms of our humanities that we are proven over time. We know, child of God, that sometimes our blind spots require the light of the glory of God to shine. My first prayer for us is that we would allow light. We would allow the light in. We will not put blinders up. Sometimes a blinder that is often up that keeps the, the glory and the light of God out of our existence, it causes us to become much more susceptible to the to those who would lie to us, to those who would profit our, off of our blindness. You can't tell me, child of God, that this week we haven't seen that. We haven't seen the, the, the consequence of the blind leading the blind. We have literally seen the blind lead the blind into a ditch. God help us if we would not ask those who are leading us, can you see? Can you discern? This is why some of us need to ask some hard questions to our leaders, our political leaders, our religious leaders, our social leaders. Can you discern and fully apprehend the depth of this wickedness called white supremacy, racial hierarchy, systemic and structural violence? Do you fully understand the ways in which our systems are grinding away at the humanity of all peoples with disproportionate impact to non-white folks. Why is that important? Because if they cannot discern it fully, how can they lead us in a time when the fire is raging and the bosoms of our country are being burned? How can one lead if they cannot discern? And it is our responsibilities as followers to not follow leaders who are unable to see and discern, to not follow leaders who do not have the courage to call out the wickedness that grinds at the bodies and the minds and the souls of God's people. And so we have a responsibility as followers to hold our leaders accountable, to demand that their leadership, which is gifted by us to them with accountability to God and creation, they must live up to that leadership. And that leadership requires several things. The first thing it requires is that fundamentalism is not a leadership quality that we can allow to be seen in this season. Fundamentalism limits our reach and our impact. It, it, it causes us to shrink knowledge and into a rigidity that does not have the space or the capacity of life that encompasses the nations, as the scripture says. There's an important passage that uh, I love to refer to from the writings of Paul in the Corinthian text and in the Philippians text because he talks about how God in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, how God has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant. You ought to just say that God has made me competent as a minister of a new covenant. Say that again. God has made me competent as a minister of a new covenant. What does this mean? It means that you and I are being called into a new way of life. A way of life, as Paul continues to say, not of the letter, but of the spirit. Lord, have mercy. Oh, God is saying that the, the letter of the law, it kills, but the spirit gives life. The letter of the law kills, but the spirit gives life. There is a, a way of leading and a way of describing 
our kind of social and religious and, and even relational interactions with such rigidity and fundamentalism that there is no room for the uh, uh, vicissitudes of life, the, the differences, the challenges, those unplanned parts of your life. Lord, have mercy. That you did not see coming. How many of you can say, I got some parts of my life that I did not anticipate? Well, the scripture says that the letter kills the 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 rigidity, the fundamentalism, the 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 bondage of 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 wanting to hold people to a standard that you yourself could not literally fulfill. But the spirit gives life. What is so important about the spirit? The spirit is the cradle by which God's possibilities are exploded into the world. The spirit has the power, uh, the ruach of God, as, as described in the Hebrew, uh, 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 the Hebrew text, the breath of God that brings new life, the pneuma of God, as described in the, in the Christian New Testament scriptures that fell on, on the day of Pentecost. The ruach creates, the spirit empowers. All of these things bring life to the believer. How is that important? Because in our lives, as we struggle with the realities, the spirit gives us life. And when you aren't moving in the spirit of possibility, fundamentalism takes root in your heart and creates fear, xenophobia, racism, otherisms. It creates hierarchies. It creates these polar these polarities that actually kill. And so part of what I want you to appreciate, child of God, that in this moment, we must, if we're going to rise and shine, master the ability to not be fundamentalist in our orientation. What we saw in Washington, D.C. was fundamentalism run amok. What is in the response of we who are eschewing this kind of fundamentalism. We must take the threat seriously. And this is where I find there to be an important balance between compassion and accountability. We must defeat the threat, but not destroy the peoples. Defeat the threat, but not destroy the peoples. It is so important for you and I to keep reminding ourselves that defeating the enemy's plans does not have to require the destruction of your enemy. Oh man, <clears throat> it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very powerful, powerful, uh, but important concept because some of us are often so uh, 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 wired and formed to wage war against the flesh and blood, not being reminded that there are principalities that require defeat. And there is a principality of Greed, a principality of avarice, a principality of domination and colonialism. That literally is the description, I believe, of what the prophet is talking about. Where gloom and darkness covers the earth. God is inviting you and I to defeat that without defeating or destroying those who we know are literally caught in the hypnosis of this wickedness. We must speak with clarity and describe it as wicked but also offer a path home for the repentance that does bring healing. We must continue to push for the exposing of the wicked schemes. Why? Because that is our contribution of light. And as we expose and as we teach and as we educate, it is in that process that we begin to reclaim the kind of world and community that has been left to us as stewards. As we speak these truths in our relationships and in our friendships and in our neighborhoods, it is the way in which we rebuild our communities. As we speak these truths in love and in relationship, it is the way we recover from the harm and the pain that may have been caused in our lives. But you and I are then called to not just a shoe fundamentalism, not to just uh, focus on the ability to defeat but not destroy, but we must be competent builders. Why? Because competent builders of God's work, competent builders of God's work allow us to build 
things, not to be an agent of destruction. And I do believe, child of God, that in this moment, there's lots around us that must be rebuilt. I do believe that in this moment, we are being invited into the master builder class of God. I love this passage in the biblical text that talks about how we are being called into the master builder work of God in 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, verse 10. Paul says it like this, by the grace that God has given to me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, a master builder, and now someone else is building on it. I want you to know that you are being invited to build now on that foundation that has been left to you. That the foundation that has been left to you, the foundation of prayer, the foundation of consecration, the foundation of love, peace and justice. There's a foundation that has been left to you that we must build on. And guess what? Not all of us have been given that as an inheritance. Some of us have been given a foundation of despair, of addiction, of violence, of, of, of trauma. But even that foundation as a wise builder, God is giving you tools to be able to build on this foundation. Verse number 11, Paul goes on to say that no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus. For if anyone builds on this foundation, they use gold. Listen to the tools and the, the contributions that can be brought. They use silver. They use costly stones. They use wood, hay, or straw. Verse 13, their work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. I want you to know, child of God, that every one of our foundations ha will have the materials we bring uh, to build upon it. But the day is coming. The time will come where it will be tested. When you are on your job, you will be tested. When you're in your relationships, you will be tested. When you are uh, voting in the booth, you will be tested. And those things that you have been working to build the found on the foundation given to you, it will be exposed. It will show, is it gold? Is it wood? Is it silver? Is it costly stones? Is it hay? Or is it straw? And the fire will test the quality of each person's work. And the scripture goes on to say, if what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. But if it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved even through, even though only as one accepting through the flames. What is that saying? It's saying that even though we may have to go through the fire of our mistakes, and even though we may have to go through the struggle of our decisions, even though our circumstances may give to us uh, certain kinds of tools that we know are, are not uh, 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 strong enough or effective enough to help us build with God's greatest design in mind that those moments will still afford us an opportunity to be saved, to be redeemed, to have a second chance, that God will not leave us to our own devices, but God will allow you and I to be tested on that day. Oh, I'm here to tell you that even though the testing has come, uh, you did not flunk the test, that even though you may have gotten some answers wrong, you are not a dropout. Oh, you ought to put in your chat, I'm still here. By the grace of God, my, my building and my foundation has outlasted the fire, and I've lost a few things along the way, but I find something being built inside of me that that fire cannot extinguish, that I have a different level of hope and trust in God that I did not have before. I have a different level of, of consciousness that I did not have before. I have a certain clarity of the schemes of the enemy that I did not have before. And because I'm able to see more clearly now that the rain is gone, now that the gloom is gone, I can experience the glory of the Lord that is rising among us. And child of God, if you can experience the glory of the Lord, if you can experience the rising of God's presence in your life, how many of you know there ain't no devil in hell? There ain't no demon on this earth. There ain't no person that is created that can push and keep you out of the will of God's perfect plan in your life. You and I are being called and asked to lean into this moment with a greater sense of God's glory. Not a glory that causes us to escape from struggle, 
but a glory that causes us to shine in the midst of the struggle of doom and gloom, of challenge and struggle. My brother, my sister, my loved one, my hope with these sermon conversations is that you and I will not allow the, the challenges that are before us to steal the light and the glory that is rising around us. It is within our reach. It is within your reach. And so may we reach for the light. May we step into the light. May we demand of our leaders and even of ourselves the kind of needed sight and vision that catapults us into a season of rebuilding and recovery, reclaiming and reimagining. The themes of our church this year are intended to catalyze us into a posture of possibility. The preaching and the teaching, the formation, the service opportunities are intended to ignite within you the possibility of God's activity. That you need not be perfect in order to master that which God has placed in your hand. You just need to be persistent, available, humble, and conscious of the light that is rising among us. God, I pray for all who are here with us. I pray, Lord, for the power of your glory and your light. It is rising among us. It is giving us, God, a sense of your presence that is so needed in this moment. So I pray in the name of Jesus that the light of salvation rises in the heart of your people. I pray that the strength of your glory rises in the hearts of your people. I pray that the hope of this season, though filled or characterized by gloom and challenge, I pray, God, that it would still rise among us and it will unleash, Lord God, the possibilities of our call. Bless every person who is here, God, with us, walking this journey as followers of the way of Jesus Christ. Bless all of us, Lord God, who make up the community of our church, both our extended community, our familiar community, our ministry community. God, I pray that you will continue to shine your light on us, in our marriages, in our friendships, in our, our sickness and illnesses, in our struggles and challenges. Shine light, Lord God, that brings freedom and liberation and healing and restoration and wholeness. And Lord, we'll say thank you for it. Once again, God, we pray for the blessings of all those who serve on the front lines, Lord God, of this coronavirus. Lord God, those who work in our political systems, Lord God, our capital buildings at the local and the state, federal levels, Lord God, the imminent threats that are being breathed by the wicked, Lord God, and the deceived. I pray, God, that you will cause and help us, Lord, to show up in ways that shine light and expose the wickedness of the enemy, that we defeat, Lord God, these ideologies of of, of hierarchy, these ideologies of domination, these ideologies of imperialism and division. And Lord, even as we defeat these ideologies, Lord, those who are ready to repent and be redeemed, God, I pray that their destruction will not, Lord God, keep them from that opportunity. But God, I pray that we will be builders, Lord God, builders in this season of great destruction. And we'll say thank you, God, for it all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. We love you with the love of the Lord. Next week, Pastor Tracy Blackman will be delivering our message for our Martin Luther King Jr. Sunday. So come on back and let's 
Be blessed by Pastor Tracy next week. In Jesus' name.